ye up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat, to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount of Carmel. And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. I... I Love the story of Elijah, excuse me for a second, and all the things that he did in his life and his walk, and, and it's, it's always intrigued me because just, uh, I guess, the applicability of it, how you can use it in your life so much. It's, it's amazing to see what the Lord did for him and also how it can apply to our lives today. You think some of the most astonishing things that happened, I mean, just before this chapter, uh, we had the, the prophets of Baal situation. And if you really think about that, that's amazing. That's stupendous what just happened there. It's, it's something that I, I, couldn't, I don't think I've ever actually physically seen in my existence other than in the Bible of where a man trusted in God to the extent that he, wa he, he splashed water on the altar multiple times, dug a trench, filled that with water while spilling the water on there, and then prayed unto the Lord with such faith and belief that the fire of the Lord came down and ate it. And then afterwards said, hey, guess what? Now it's time to take care of the prophets of Baal. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. When you think about this, it's super, you're like, wow, that's amazing. But yet you can take that same thing that's so spiritually, just spiritually amazing and go, how can I apply this to my life? And it has so many great applications within itself. Just right after this, right after that event happened, this event happens where he t he's talking to them and he says, um, If, actually, if you, let's go to verse number 17 real quick. Or actually, let's go back to verse number, uh, chapter 17, verse number 1 real quick. And this is kind of going to set the pace of the story of what happened here. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And then the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. And it's just slightly before this, if you go back to uh, chapter 16, verse number 29, you get the gist of why this actually happened. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, Omri, Omri I believe, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Nebat that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Eth Baal, forgive me, king of Zidonians, Zidonians, forgive me, and went and ser served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord of God of Israel to anger than all kings of Israel that were before him. And if you continue before that point, actually, there's no good that happened that I see <laughs> in this chapter. Every king that was in this chapter did that which was wrong in the sight of the Lord. And it just continued to the extent that when finally Ahab came around, it goes, oh, guess what? I, th I, he's going to go even further than those who went before him. And then in response, in chapter 17, Elijah the Tishbite is called. And he says, there will be no rain. If you go to chapter 18, the beginning of it, and it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came, verse 1, to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So it's been three years. Three years between that point in time. Now, a lot happens between there and to all the way to the point of three years. And they even talk about some of the stuff, like um, the lady who had a son who was dying. And I, talk, I spoke about this this morning in the Sunday school class. And uh, that uh, her, you know, she didn't have meal for the child. And they were going to uh, go to verse, chapter 17, verse number 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the curse of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. 
and this is Elijah speaking to that lady who was like, I'm, just, I'm gathering sticks right now to use the little bit of food I have left so that my son and I can eat and die. And he says, no, it's not going to fail. And then it doesn't. <laughs> it's awesome. The, the story continues, and then the prophets of Baal situation kicks into play through chapter 18. And then right after the prophets of Baal situation, Elijah said unto Ahab, verse 41 in chapter 18, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to Carmel, and then everything that continues on. Now, I love the rain. I, don't <laughs> I know it's a little change of subject here, but I do. I, I actually enjoy the rain. At first, I used to not like the rain at all, and then I married somebody who loves the rain, and you, as you marry somebody who loves the rain, and if you love the person, eventually you become more like the person. So at first it was like, rain is rain, whatever. It's just something that happens, and I just wear a jacket. That's, that's kind of how I kind of took it. But then as my other half, my wife, she loves the rain. She, she'd say, let's go walking. Let's go walking. I'm like, why do we want to be cold? Come on, let's go walking. It's so beautiful. I'm like, it's beautiful and wet. Like, <laughs> I don't understand why that's beautiful. And then, but as time continued, of course, you know, I, I grew to love it too. I grew to enjoy not just the walking with my wife in the rain, but I, also, but I also grew to enjoy the fact that to hear the rain hit on top of the umbrella, to, to watch it as it affects everything around me, to see the work of God's hand across the world in rain. It's amazing. And I love the rain. I really do. And it's a wonderful thing. And, and I, again, I, I can't emphasize the fact of how much I enjoy walking underneath an umbrella with my wife in the rain, hearing the <laughs> especially if you've got a really small one. A small umbrella, because then you're like this. <laughs> <And> then <laughs> now, it's a wonderful thing. Now, that's one thing for me, though. And that's, I live in this time period, and that's, that's something I enjoy about the rain. But now also, the people in the Old Testament also enjoyed the rain, but it was for a much different reason than, or, I mean, they probably enjoyed it too. Maybe they enjoyed the walking too. But uh, it was for a much different reason than for the fact of, oh, it's just raining outside. If, if you know anything, they were a farm culture. <laughs> Rain was important. Rain was very, very important in that time period. And we can go into the, all that stuff and talk about that, but we don't actually, I'm not going to go into that tonight. Um, we, we, we'll go into that another time and talk about the, you know, the culture of what it means to, what it was to be a farmer back in that day. It was not an easy thing. I mean, even if you read Little House on the Prairie, which that's, that's some crazy stuff there. Somebody just says, hey, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go, we're going to pick up our family and leave, and then we're just going to build a house in the middle of nowhere. That's, that's crazy enough as is. But now let's go back to the point in time before we had stuff that was made, that made things easier, like, I don't know, uh, yeah, a house. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, but they needed it for many important reasons. Understand that the rainfall is important. It's important because of the fact of every living thing in the world needs water. Everything. Every living thing in the world needs water. Now, of course, in our farm days nowadays, we have something called irrigation systems, which is a little bit different. And that, that helps with some things. But even still, when droughts happen and there's no way to use the irrigation system, people begin to panic because we all understand that every living thing needs water. It needs it to survive. It needs it to live. It needs it to thrive. And without water, things die. Also, this, is in, this can also be said in our Christian life also. Our Christian lives need water. We need the water. We need we need it. It's, it, it you, you die without the living water. Drinking at the... Uh, we have so many good things. Um, that's also why... I would, I'm going to explain it like this to you. It's going to be a little bit different than you, I guess you'd think, and this is what I came up with when I was... When the Lord were talking about this. It's also why, as a Christian, when the abundance of rain happens, you look forward to it. You look forward to the points in time where you really see the water come, when you really see, I would say, the blessings fall in your life. I mean, as much as we all want to go and be that perfect Christian who is like Paul, who says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound, and I know how to be you know, dead and alive at the same time. I can't even remember all the verses off the top of my head right now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know how to do all these things and all, you know, all, in whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. You know, y y we love to be Paul sometimes, but I, I have to be honest. I like it when the rain comes. I love when the blessings fall. I love when, I, when my cup runneth over and I cry to the Lord and say, Lord, this is too much. I didn't, I, I didn't expect this. 
I didn't expect this much to come. I asked for this, but this is, this is, it's just too much for me. Listen to what the Lord says about the people of Israel. If you take your Bible and go back to um, Deuteronomy chapter 8, this is not just me, though. This is not just you. This is also everybody, every single Christian. And, and, and don't, don't miss this idea that they don't look forward to the rain or the, or the blessings that come. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 through 14. And this is um, Moses speaking, or God speaking through Moses to the people. And it says, and it shall come to pass... Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 through uh, uh, 14. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be the basket of thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, the in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way, and then flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous and good. In goods, so forgive me, in the fruits of thy body, and in the fruits of thy cattle, and in the fruits of thy ground, and in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasures, the heaven to give the rain unto the land in his season, to bless all the work of thine hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head, and not the tail, and thou shalt be above, on, uh, above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If that Thou, if that thou hearken unto the commandment of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. Now, I don't know about you, when I read that I say, who doesn't want that? <laughs> I, I can't, I can't, I, of course now specifically speaking, some of this stuff is directed to them, but then some of this stuff actually even broadcast, as you see later on in the Bible, that some of this stuff goes to us as Christians too. They repeat it to the Christians also, not all of it, of course. Um, I think you can try to take some of it and kind of shift it around, but like for instance, uh, anyways, we're not going to go into that. But who wouldn't want that? When they heard this, I bet you they didn't go, oh, that kind of sounds nice. I bet you they thought in their mind like, man, what would that be like? What is that, what is that that abundance of rain. What is that blessings in which I see? I, I mean, what would it be like to, to have victory in everything? What would it be like if you were to, to walk into a place and you were, I guess, and I, I don't like to use this term because it's kind of worldly, but respected? Not because of the fact that you have any ability of your own, but because the Lord and God which you serve is known throughout the land because of he's worked through you. What would it be like if every time you tried to plant something, it worked? I have a brown thumb. I don't have a green thumb. <laughs> Joke. <laughs> uh, I have a brown thumb. I'm not the guy that you can say, hey, go take this and plant that thing and it'll work. It's, it's go take this and plant that thing and you just killed it. And, and that's, that's kind of the way it works. But what if would it be that if you took a seed, any seed, you were eating an apple one day and you took that apple seed and you just went bloop, and the next couple weeks an apple tree grew. And not only would it grow, it would grow plenteous. It would grow massive. It would grow and it would produce great fruit. What would it be like if everything that your hand touched, any work that you did, became something of amazement? It's not like the basis like, oh, I'm going to try to build a house. Oh, hope it works out. It's, I'm going to try to build a house. And not only is it going to be a house, it's going to be a great, well-built, good foundation home that will be for, for generation to generation. I cannot see why anybody wouldn't want that, especially even during that time period. Or let's bring it a little further ahead. Who doesn't want that? Or Psalm chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. Psalm chapter 23, verse 1 through 6. 
Psalm 23, verse 1 through 6. And it's a very famous song. I've used this psalm many a time when I'm afraid or when I'm, when I'm trying to really focus in on the Lord a little bit. And, and I've heard the psalm uh, memorized and preached many times. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a thing saying, I believe in what God does. I believe that the Lord is going to take care of me, not just in the good times, but also in the bad times. This is David's call into the Lord that he trusted in his God to take care of him. Now, again, this is something that I think, I don't think anybody in this room would say, nah, I don't want that. I would suspect that everybody in this room at one point or another would say that would be kind of cool to have in my life. That, that would be kind of cool to have working. But, and this is where the turn comes. There's a little bit of a, something happens for us. Something Something happens between the point in time before the rain happens, and I would, get, I would say it's kind of like the waiting point, where some people make it through and see the blessings, see the amazing, abundant rain. But the truth of the matter is, is that's not true for everyone. Some people never make it to that point. They never see the abundant rain. They may see the basic blessings that come from the Lord, like, you know, like the fact that you breathe and the fact that you live and the fact that he loves you beyond anything else and the fact that he's always calling unto you. But there's also a truth, too, that there's some people who will never see, or not never see, that's, I don't want to use an absolute, who will have very, a lot of trouble ever seeing when the abundant rain comes through. Where they can say, and I, and I love the statement when I said, my cup runneth over, because I can see there are some people in this room who understand what we're talking about. But then I can also see in this room that some people are like, I have no clue what you're talking about. What do you mean my cup runneth over? I've never heard of that before. Like, I mean, I've been blessed. But if you're saying, like, my cup runneth over, like, have you, I mean, I, it's, it's a, it's, that's a foreign thing to me. I remember when it was a foreign thing to me, too, when somebody was crying and say, Lord, I can't handle any more blessings. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? How, how could you say you can't handle any more blessings? Dude, that doesn't even make sense. Like, you're, isn't that what we want? We want the blessings. Isn't the blessings good? But then I got to that extent one day when finally my cup runneth over. And it's not the fact that you're really saying, Lord, stop it. I don't want any more blessings. But you're saying, God, I've been so blessed. I don't even know what to do with it. I, I'm so overrun with the blessings that I've received within my life that it, it just, it boggles my mind. I have, you haven't even told me what I'm supposed to do with it yet. I just know that I have it and I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to do something with it. God, please, thank you. Direct my path and what I'm supposed to do. Now, all that said, that's not true for everybody in the room. That's not true for every Christian that's out there watching this on my stream right now. Some people are like, I've seen the blessings of the Lord. I've seen when the Lord has come. I've seen when he's brought the abundant rain into my life. And some people are like, I have no clue what you're talking about. So I want to talk a little bit about that moment, that, 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 that thing that separateth us from the abundant rain. And this is only one example of many that you can use to kind of talk about this. Take your Bible and go back to Eli uh, 1 King Elijah. Take your Bible and go back to 1 Kings chapter number 18. Chapter number 18, and we're just going to go to verse 41. Verse number 41 again, and that's chapter 1 Kings 18, verse 41. And we already read this verse. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundant rain. Again, this is just after the circumstance with the prophet of Baal, meaning the prophets have already been slain. Um, the Lord has already shown himself righteous and powerful. He's already done the fiery thing and ate up the water and licked up the food. He's done some amazing things. So people are probably on a pretty good spiritual high at this moment in time going, Whoa! We just saw the Lord work. And then he turns to Ahab and says, 
Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundant rain coming. They haven't had rain for three years. Three years. You got to understand this. I don't. There's only. I don't know if there's any place on this earth that doesn't rain for three years. We live in Tacoma, Washington. I don't even understand. Like that doesn't even. That boggles my mind. Every day is 75% chance of rain. That's that's the way it is. And but. It continues and says, So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to, eat to the top of Mount Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. And I, 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 like I said, I like to picture things as I'm doing this, like I'm, I'm thinking about it. And I can just see Elijah just kind of go, I guess the best way to boot it would be, sorry if you can't see this. He sits down, and he's either going to do this, <laughs> Or he's going to be kind of like this. And he's looking. His face is between his knees. He's either got his head down and he's looking. Or he's looking straight ahead. And he turns to his servant. And said to his servant, verse number 43, Go up now. Look toward the sea. And he went up and he looked. So now let's think. He's sitting. And he goes to his servant, he says, come here. The other guy goes, yes, sir. And he goes, go up there and look towards the sea. The servant goes, yes, yes, let's do this. He goes up, looks, comes back to him and says, nothing. Nothing's happening. It's as clear as day. And he said, go again seven times. Now, I, I, I like to, I mean, we love to do the numerical thing and look at it and say, why seven? Why seven? Why does he choose seven out of all the numbers and just like that? Seven, and, I, and we're not going to talk about uh, how the Bible uses numbers in so many different interesting ways and stuff like that and what they represent and stuff like that. But I, I find it interesting, and if you ever get a chance to really look into it, look into the idea of why the Bible uses certain numbers. And don't add unto, though, but, but look at it. It's pretty interesting. But let, let's, let's be real about this now. And I don't know about you. I'm going to put this in a more practical nature. I went up to the top of this thing. I looked off of the ridge, and I looked towards the sea, and I saw nothing. I came back, and I told him, there is nothing. He then turns to him and says, go up seven times. And he goes back to what he's doing. Now, this is the Christian life. You've now been given a command of what you're supposed to do. Now, most of us, when we get this, we go, okay, that's cool. Let's do this. First time. We're on the second round. Go up to the top. Nothing. Come back down. And you tell them, nothing's happening. I said seven. Okay. This is number three. All right. Nothing. Remember, it hasn't rained for three years. And he comes back down, and he's like, Sir, there is nothing. He said, I said seven. He's now walking. I don't know about you, but probably by this point in time, me, I'm probably not running now. I may have an idea, and I may have a hope that I'm going to see something, but... Because I am as human as anybody else, more than likely, I've already set my idea and my thought on, when I head up this next time, number four, I suspect to see nothing. So I head up to number four. And do you know what I see? Nothing. So then I turn back around. What'd you see? I saw nothing. I said seven times. What would you see? What do you think I saw, Elijah? I said seven times. Now this part, 
maybe it's because of the fact that they hadn't seen rain in a while. But then he tells them, there's like clouds over there. I, I see some clouds, and he runs back down, and he says, there's, there's, there's some clouds. There's some clouds that look like the form of a hand, and, 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 and there's, there's actually something out there. And then he tells them, because obviously he didn't see the rain. He just saw the clouds. He says, now go tell Ahab. The rain's coming. This is a very, very simple conversation. Very, very simple idea. We all know the verses like James chapter 1, verse 2 and 4, if you take your Bible there. James chapter 1, verse 2 and 4. We use these verses to encourage ourselves. We use these verses to, to, to push ourselves and to, and to go farther than we, we would normally go. James chapter 1, verse 2 and th through 4 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect, and entire, wanting nothing. You tell yourself this, and you remind yourself this, and you say, yes, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to understand that this, this process in which I'm going through is supposed to make me perfect. It's supposed to guide me, and it's supposed to help me. You also got verses like Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. We remind ourselves of these verses because they're important, and they're true, and they're good. But what we often forget is that this is gold tried in fire. I use this example of walking back and forth. And it's a very small example of this. And it's not a, I guess you'd say it's not a major example of this. But that walking back and forth only took a few seconds for me. Because I'm only going from that point to that point over there. But I can say in some of our Christian lives, some of us have been going for years, years, walking to that point. Because the Lord said, I told you to go and check. You're probably on year two, maybe year three. And you go up to the edge, and you look out, and you see nothing. So then you turn back around. And you go back to the Lord, and the Lord says, what did you see? And you say, Lord, don't you know? You know everything. You know what I'm going through. You know what I've been through. Do I have to honestly tell you what I saw? Yes, tell me what you saw. I saw nothing. Go again. How many of y'all have ever been at this point before? The Lord says, just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. Job chapter 23, verse number 10. Job chapter 23, verse number 10. Says this. Job said this, and he said, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Now what we do as Christians, and what we do as people, is we usually emphasize that ending part, which is, I shall come forth as gold, which you should. You should, because that's a good thing. That's what the Lord is going to do to you. But don't miss that middle part either. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Continue on, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, no, sorry, Proverbs chapter number 17. Proverbs chapter number 17. Proverbs 17, verse number 3. The finding pot is for silver, and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. Again, the, the finding pot is for silver, and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold, that, that, pres that, per that, yeah, 
Let me go there. First Peter chapter one verse seven. <laughs> Let's go there. First Peter chapter one verse seven. I think I just messed that up in my writing there. First Peter chapter one verse seven says that the trial of your faith being more precious than of gold that per perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Again, let's take our lives and kind of match it up to this real quick. Now, this comes in different forms, and I can't tell you the trial or whatever the Lord told you to do. Now, some of this is something miraculous and amazing. Some of this could be taken in other directions. Um, I will give you a case in point, and I'll just use a personal one because um, this can be used in many different fashions and forms. For the longest time, this took many years in my life, I gave my heart over to the Lord and said, Lord, I want to do what you have for me in my life. I said, God, whatever it may be, I will be a missionary. I will be a, an evangelist. I will go to the highways and byways. I will talk to any person you'd have me to do. Lord, tell me what to do, and I will do it. Now, the hard part about this is, is that I had a dream, too. I thought, in my mind, that this is going to be something amazing, something big, something stand out in front of the crowd and do kind of thing, fleshly speaking. This is true. And so I said to myself, in the end of this, what's going to happen is, is that I'm going to be a missionary, or I'm going to be an evangelist, or I'm going to be something that has to deal with standing out in the front, and this is how it's going to be. Now, however I get to that extent, however, whatever happens in between there, that's between God and me, and that's how it's going to work. But in the end of it all, this is how it's going to work. So I went to the Lord and said, Lord, what do you have me to do? And he said, I want you to go out to the top of that thing, and I want you to look out there, and I want you to tell me what you see. I said, okay, God, let's do this. We're going. Let's go. Let's go. Woo! Woo! All right, it's nothing. Keep trusting the Lord. Everything's good. You know, everything happens for a reason. Let's do this, God. I, would, I saw nothing, but no matter what, everything's going to be great. We're going to make it. Everything's going to be fine, right? Let's do this, God. And God says, okay, that's good. I'm glad. I'm so glad that you're still here with me. Go again. I go. All right, God, let's do this. Let's go. We're going to go back up again. We're going up to the mountain. Woo! All right, I don't see anything, but it's okay because all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, right? Amen. All right, God, I didn't see anything. What am I supposed to do? I want you to go back up again. Okay, God, let's go. All right. All right, nothing again. Everything works together for good. This is years for me. This isn't days. This isn't weeks. This is years of my life. And not just, I, I make it look a little bit simpler because just coming back once or twice, but this is me coming back to the Lord many times on my knees and saying, God, what will you have me to do? I'm doing the basic things, God. I will do all that you have me to do. What is it? Just, just tell me what the ending goal is. Tell me what the blessings that are coming. Tell me what it's going to be. And he kept coming back and saying, Lord, what would it be? He says, go again. I can tell you flat out, there was an extent where I just said, God, what do you want me to do? And say, go again. All right. Why am I doing this? You know how much I suffer day by day sitting here? And I walk up to this ridge, and you know what I'm going to see when I get up there? Nothing. And guess what? Nothing. Do I even want to go look at him? Do I even want to talk to him now? I already know what he's going to tell me to do. You know what he's going to tell me to do? Go again. And I'm being real with you. I'm not trying to be fake. I'm not trying to be false. And I know that we, please understand, I have all due respect for God. I love the Lord with all my heart. I try to do the best I can to follow the Lord. But I'm being as real as possible with you right now. I came back to the Lord thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of times, asking the same question. What do you want me to do? And you know what his answer was? I want you to go up to that edge. I don't want you to tell me what you see. This 
is where we see the differences between people's stance with God. This is where we see where people see the abundant rain or don't. And I'm not saying that it's wrong that you don't see it or that they don't see it or if anybody hasn't seen it before. There was a point in time I didn't see it either. It's not wrong. It's just... There is a point in which you can take your entire Christian life and wrap it up into one thought, which is, why am I doing this? You forget about salvation. You forget about all the blessings that you have received up until that point in time, whether or not it be your family, whether or not it be your friends, whether or not it be all this stuff. You forget about all the, the different other things that he's blessing you with along the road during this point in time, these many years of you coming up. And you stop thinking about that. The only thing you think about whenever you come to church, whenever you sit down in the pew, whenever you even come to God, the back of your mind, it always sits there, which is, I know what I'm supposed to do. I know I'm supposed to keep plugging forward. I know I'm supposed to continue to seek the Lord. I know that he is good, and I know that he is righteous. I know all these things. Why does he keep sending me up there? Why don't he just answer the question? Why can't I just get an answer to it? Why can't I see something different? Why can't it be that one day I walk up there, and, then there, and for once this time when I finally walk up there, it's going to be a different picture than just nothing. This is what I can say to that. Don't forget why you're going up there. There's only actually one thing for this. One, usually I do three. Let's talk about the three applications today. I'm not going to do it tonight. Just one. Don't forget why you're going up there. Hosea, chapter number six, verse number three. Hosea chapter number 6, verse number 3 says, Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Let me explain this to you, and this was very difficult. And it took me years and years to kind of come to this understanding of how this works. It doesn't matter how many times God tells you to go up to that mountaintop. It matters how many times you continue to go up to that mountaintop and look. If the Lord was to tell you 100 million times to just keep going up there, back and forth, and said, go and look off the edge, and then tell me what you see. That is what the Lord has told you to do. What matters is what you do with that. Now, let's bring this to the completion of this a little bit more. For many years, my walk became pretty bitter. You probably would never see it because, in general, I'm a pretty upbeat, happy-go-lucky, energetic kind of guy. And it's very easy to make, people or to make people feel a certain way, especially when you know how to deal with people, when you know how to talk to people, when you know how to be energetic, when you know that when your energy can affect other people, it's very easy to make you, other people understand or feel as if everything's okay. It's very easy. Now, honestly, spiritually speaking, there are points in time where I would drag myself here, dragging, just... I have no clue what I'm doing walking towards this mountain. And it's not like I didn't understand the biblical truths. It's not like I didn't understand the who God is and what he is or anything like that. But I had been walking up and down this same path so often and seeing nothing at the end of it, or at least what I thought was nothing, that at a certain extent I started going, what's the point? Why the abundant rain? And then something hit me. I got back once, and I sat, and I started talking with the Lord, 
I said, God, why does this keep happening to me? Why am I so bitter? Why am I so angry? Why am I so frustrated with these things that's, why am I so, why are we doing, why am I doing this, God? And not no meaning, mean meaning answer or anything at this point in time. It wasn't frustrated. It was just, it was just real. God, I don't know why I'm doing this anymore. You keep telling me to go up to the, this point in time and look off the edge and look for something. And I keep looking for something, but I see nothing. God, the Lord told me, and he turned to me, and he, I guess he kind of said as if the same thing that he kind of said to this servant here. I didn't tell you what to look for. I told you to go. What did you learn along the way? What did you pick up? What trials have you gone through now, Pierce? What fire have I put you into? Let's switch this off to you. What trials has the Lord put you through? What fire has God put you under? What hammer has he hit you with and taught you something that you would have never learned if you would have went, did, did it any other way? You would have never learned if you weren't in the circumstance and the situations that you were particularly put in. Some people, it may be physical conditions. Some people, it may be spiritual conditions. Some people, it may be completely mental conditions. To each his own, because the Lord actually works on every single person in their own special way, because he made you that way. He has the best way to talk to you. He knows how he can talk to you. He knows how he can get your attention. He knows you better than anybody, anybody in the entire world. He knows every hair. He knows the name of, he can count the number of hairs on your head. He knows exactly what he can do to get that button, that to get you to right where you need to be. But sometimes it's not something that's going to be, you got it. There's the abundance. Just go up there once. Everything's fine. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's super simple. It is just a basic, go right up there. Just do what I say. And it is. But there are some things that you're going to go through that I went through and finally came out of it to understand that it had nothing to do with what I was looking for. It had everything to do what the Lord told me to do. It had everything to do with it. Every single bit of it. And now I look back and I go, why did I do that? Why was I so angry during that point in time? Why was I so bitter? Why did I let relationships get ruined? Why did I fight? Why did I burden the Lord so much, honestly, I'd have to say in certain instances. Why did I always come to him so frustrated with certain things when really overall, he actually does have control of it all. That he's putting you in the fire on purpose. That he's walking you through this thing. And he actually has this abundance of rain that is coming. But he's waiting for you to keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. He's looking for you to keep walking up there. Not because of the fact that you're supposed to see something amazing sometimes. Sometimes it is. But Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it all has to do with the journey that's being going on there, the walking back and forth. He told that servant to go up there seven times. You know, he actually went up there eight times, and on the eighth time, you know what he saw? A cloud that looked like a hand. I, one, that's awkward. Just right out there, I don't even know. Like, that's an awkward thing. Like, if, if I just saw it, I walked up there, and it was, I'd be like, ah! <laughs> now, that's just me. But do you know what I saw when I finally got to the end and when he finally showed me something? I walked to the edge, I looked, I looked out, and I did something I'd never done before. I looked down, and I saw my reflection, and I saw something real ugly. I saw something real not God-honoring, which then forced me to go back and talk to the Lord and say, what have I become? This entire time, me walking back and forth, walking back and forth, thinking that I had this idea of what I'm supposed to do with my life and how it's supposed to work. It was supposed to work like this, God. I was supposed to, after I became the four-year period of finally giving my life to the Lord, I was supposed to go to 
I don't know, let's just throw this idea. I was supposed to go to Bible college for two years, and then I was supposed to get out of Bible college, and then I was supposed to become a missionary, go to do my deputation for four years, and then go and become a missionary somewhere out in the field. And you were supposed to directly tell me where I was supposed to go. Or if that's not supposed to work, then the God, what was supposed to happen is maybe I was supposed to continue on training and then become an assistant pastor somewhere, someplace. And that's how it was supposed to go. Or if not that thing, Lord, how come it didn't become that I was supposed to become an evangelist doing this thing or that thing or this thing or that thing? This is how it was supposed to go, God. This is the plan that I thought it was supposed to go. And the Lord said, I still have a plan for you. There's an abundance of rain that is coming. But I need you to go up that hill. And I need you to look out there. And I need you to tell me what you see. Last but not least, Isaiah chapter 8, verse number 35 through 36. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 35 through 36. Wait. Oh, I went to Isaiah 35. <laughs> um, Isaiah chapter 8, verse number 35. Say, wait, what? There is a verse. I, I guess I wrote the, the thing wrong. I, I apologize for it. Maybe it's verse 18, chapter 18. I wrote the actual verse, though, so if you can find it, that'd be great, too. Um, it actually says, when heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they pray towards this place and confess thy name and turn from their sins when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon thy head, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. Um... I apologize for that. Usually I know where stuff is, but I, I guess I was going crazy and just was writing stuff down too nuts. Um, but that's essentially what it's talking about here, is that at some point in time, maybe that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but at one point in time, Again, for myself, the Lord said, this is what I have for you. I need you to come back to me. I need you to listen to me. I need you to hear me. I need you to do what I've asked you to do. And though it's going to be hard, and though at time periods you're not going to understand, and though you're going to have pretty much most of all the verses to understand exactly what you're supposed to do with it, I need you to keep going. I need you to st start here. I need you to tell me what you saw. And I need you to keep walking. Sometimes you're going to be dragging. Sometimes you're going to be running. Sometimes you're going to be frustrated and angry. And sometimes you're going to be happier than you ever. But what I need you to do is until you see the rain, until you see the abundance of rain coming, I need you to go up there. And that's all I'm going to ask you to do. Now here's the question to you. I got my answer. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do now. I know exactly where I'm supposed to stand now. And it took many years of conversations between me and God and a lot of failures along the way. What about you? How many of you guys would say in your Christian life at this moment in time that there is something in which you've been walking and the Lord, you, the Lord told you to walk and you're like, let's do this, I can do this, let's go. But it's been a bit of time walking this route now. It's been a little bit frustrating. It's been a little bit hard. It's been a little bit, I don't know, like there's so many words you could use to that. And even to the extent that sometimes you've gotten to the extent and said, why am I doing this? If you're there, God says, keep going. Keep going. Because the abundance of rain is coming. At the end of the story, in the servant said, there is nothing, in verse 43, 
And he said, go again seven times. And then verse number 44, and it came to pass at that seventh time that he said, behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, go up and say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. Keep going. Let's pray. Um, Lord, again, I, I thank you so much for all the different things and all the different battles and all the different struggles and all the fire and all the trials and everything that I've ever been through in my life, God. I thank you so much for the abundance of rain where my cup runneth over, God, for the different blessings that you've given unto me. But Lord, I also thank you for those time periods where I have had to literally pull myself through the miry muck, God, really, though sometimes completely self-inflicted, of just my life and just trying to pull myself just to go just that bit further. Lord, I thank you so much for every one of those moments because if it was not for that moment, I would not understand your will. I would not understand your way as much as I do. And God, not saying I'm anything amazing. You know this for a fact. I thank you so much for each and every moment in which I've, been, I've had to, 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 to push to follow you because it's worth it. It is worth every moment. It is worth every struggle. It is worth every, every bit of time that I've ever spent doing it, God. And I would never trade it back for anything in this world. I would trade the sin back, obviously, God. Those things I don't need in my life. I would trade those moments in which I, I fell on my own accord. But I would never trade anything that you've given unto me, Lord, that testing me or pushing me or, or just saying go. Lord, because the Bible's really clear about this. The Bible's really true. If you keep going you shall come forth as gold. That the Lord is looking, as Kevin kind of talked about this morning, of that faithful servant. The one in which he can look and say, I, they have done much. They have, they have done much and little, so I'm going to give them more. Um, you're looking to give that abundant blessing, that, that manna from heaven, God, that you've, you've given so often, so many times in this Bible. But Lord, so many times also we've seen that it was not an easy trek to get to that point. In the Old Testament, people marched for miles, miles and miles and miles. And then you gave manna from heaven. So let's apply it to our Christian lives today. Lord, I, I thank you so much. And I pray if there's anybody in this room who's suffering, Lord, or, or fighting, Lord, to keep pushing, keep lifting their legs and keep moving forward, I pray, God, that this is an encouragement to them, that if they continue to go, there will be an abundance of rain, that they need to look towards that end. They need to look towards the fact that the Lord has got something for them that's far greater than anything they can possibly understand. And once they finally hit that aha moment, God, they're going to look back and they're going to say, it was worth it all. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus, as the song says. And God, if there's anybody who does not know for sure they're going to heaven, They've been work living in the miry muck of this world for so long. And they don't see a way out. Lord, I pray that they hear this message and understand that there is a way out. There is a Christ who died on the cross so that they may have eternal life. That if they were to give their life over to him, if they were to, to heed to the call of, his, of salvation, God, if they were able to, if they, if they just took for a moment and thought about this thing, Lord, if they, if they grabbed onto this, they could have a freedom from the miry muck of their life. All these failures, all those things that are just, just holding them down, they can be free from sin, but only if they take hold on to eternal life. God, I, I thank you so much for this opportunity. I pray that if there's anybody who's struggling, Lord, or anybody needs salvation, that you'd work on them hearts, convict them now. As the piano plays, God, I pray that you just continue to work. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. As, amen. Um, keep your heads bowed, eyes closed as the piano plays.